Hi Brock. Hi Silver. I'm uh <clears throat> I'm doing some underpaintings today. I uh have been working on a, a method where I sort of make an underpainting first. First I start with here, let me show you. I start with the drawing like this. Then I use some oil-based house paint <laughs> to make the underpainting. And then I um, will come back to it uh, in a couple of days and rework it again with um, thicker artist paint. And that's kind of the working method that I'm using now. And, uh, I, and then, um, <clears throat> then I'll take a break. It's really cold where I am. I'm in a garage. Palo Alto. I want this to be a warm gray, so I'm adding some brown to it.
I think it's uh, almost my favorite thing to do in the in the world uh, is to make a painting. So I actually was a uh, <clears throat> professor of art and art history at a community college for about 17 or 18 years and before that I was a professor at another school and a high school teacher for a little bit and um, my whole life I've just been wanting to be in the studio full time. If you have any questions about what I'm doing or using, just drop them in the comments section. What I do is I run behind the, the, the camera slash cell phone every once in a while. And uh, I can answer some of your questions. But this is just a rough underpainting. And I'll, once I get this, underpainting done, I'll let it dry, and then I'll come back in and spend a day or two more on top of this painting, um, adding thicker paint and refining things and um, working out color more. This is just to get something down, and basically what I mentioned when I started the video was this is how I start my paintings now, I work in big batches, so I have about um, 20 paintings laid out right now. And uh, I'm in my studio in my garage. I have a studio upstairs too. It's really cold in here. Um, well, probably not so cold for you guys. It's 50 degrees in here. All right, so I'll start with So if you use a color one place, you, you want to try to use it everywhere, is what my teachers used to say to me. And so I'm going to uh, use this background color um, in the figure next, but I'm going to modify it slightly. Sometimes it helps if I make the image on my computer smaller so that I don't get caught up in the details. And um, the brush I'm using is a number 16 Blick Academic Bristle Flat right now. It's a pretty inexpensive brush. I get my brushes from uh, dickblick.com. 
And uh, this thing is filled with walnut oil, and that's filled with paint thinner. This is just a towel to clean things up with. And the uh, drawing, I did a whole bunch of drawings all at once, like I just spent literally a week um, making drawings on paper and on canvas panels to prepare for this next body of work, uh, which I'm not actually, I'm not showing in galleries or anything, but I think of them as, you know, two or three month um, campaigns in a way of making art. Um, so what I do is I plan out all my paintings sort of at once and then spend a couple of days working on the drawings, usually a week or so, and I'll lay out anywhere between 10 to, to, to 30 things. And then once I have the drawings done, um, then I'll go back in and I'll work on the, the paper things with watercolor and with um, um, acrylic for a while. And then after that, uh, I go in and I do all the underpaintings for the oil paintings um, to uh, make big solid paintings. And the reason why I break it down into those components and do the work on paper first and do the drawings first is kind of helps me to study um, and to understand what I'm trying to do with the more serious or, or longer term paintings that are um, in oil. So in a way what I do is I am constantly studying by working on paper, but I also think of those paintings as being um, the things on paper as being things that are real works of art too and are saleable and you know someone might be interested in wanting to collect them. Lately I've also been watching a lot of videos uh, on YouTube about other artists because I'm trying to, to become a little bit more about the formal or abstract qualities in the work. And so I've been uh, kind of influenced, believe it or not, by Mark Rothko and Ad Reinhardt and some other uh, abstract expressionists and color field painters from the 1950s. And I'm thinking a lot about color theory as I'm doing that. I've also been watching some more contemporary abstract painters because I think that there's this wonderful thing that happens when you start with a figurative painting and you start thinking of it in some abstract ways. So I guess this new working method, I've been doing it for about a year or two now where I plan out the paintings a little bit more in advance and then work on them in batches allows me to think about what I'm doing in a, in a slower way. Now the paint that you see me grabbing here out of these paint sticks is um, it's basically oil-based enamel paint same stuff that Jackson Pollock used for his drip paintings and Franz Klein used and I've been using them for about five or six years to do a lot of the sort of legwork in the paintings and uh, this color that I'm adding in here is uh, believe it or not it's safety orange and um, because I think of flesh tones as being oranges that lean towards pink or red so I'm going to uh, mix up a sort of big batch of flesh color right now that I can sort of brush into these other colors. The way that I do that is um, I use plastering knives. And this is just a big sheet of glass from the front of an old stereo cabinet that I have bolted to the top of a tool cart. And this is kind of how I work with, with regular artist paint as well, is that I mix things in large batches on a sheet of glass and then add to it later.
And since this paint is so liquid, it allows me to flow it on a little bit more easily. Let me see if any of you have a, put out a question or something in the comments section. I'll just wave to some of you. Now a lot of times what I use is I actually use um, inexpensive brushes I get from the hardware store called Chips. And this is like a half, uh, the one inch chip. It's just natural bristle, Indonesian bristle. And uh, a lot of times what I'll just do is use it because it'll hold a lot of paint and it's kind of stiff and will uh, allow me to get more paint um, onto the canvas or the canvas panel quicker. And I trade back and forth between uh, sizes, but um, one of the things that my teacher said to me when I was in high school, a guy named Greenberg, was big painters use a big brush. You know, and what he was trying to get us to do was to think about getting uh, big relationships and big um, decisions down quickly uh, and paint with the largest brushes you can first and then switch to smaller brushes later when you're doing more refined work. And it's a really great idea because you cover more ground more quickly uh, and also you tend to make the paint surface a little bit uh, thicker and you um, are also um, making bigger decisions that, that are how people actually see or look at a painting as, as big shapes and big values more than anything else. The other thing that my teacher used to say to us was try to work the whole painting at the same time. Don't just work one area out at a, at a time. Um, try to work out the whole thing that you think of it as a whole rather than just little areas. And I suppose I should mention that um, you know, I'm working off of a computer screen, and I, wor I sort of make the I change the image into a black and white image. If you want to show you the color version of it, um, and this is actually cropped down from a much larger figure. I just focused in on the most important parts, and what I do is I change the value structure and change it into a black and white image so that I can sort of invent the color because I don't trust or like how computer screens see color. And so what I generally do is I, I come up with a sort of palette in my head and, uh, and work with that. And um, one of the things that I've been noticing in a lot of painting tutorial videos is people talk about the palettes that they use. Like, and one of the things, for instance, about like the Zorn palette that you'll if you look that up on YouTube, you'll see a bunch of people talk about that all the time. Is that basically it's reduced down to a series of simple hues so that you don't get carried away with all with thinking just about color the entire time you're painting. And I think that's kind of important. Is to um, limit yourself in terms of the colors that you'll use until you really want to get colorful. But it just depends on, on what kind of painting you like and what the painting methods are that you like.
want this to be a little bit more saturated. And I'm going to add a little bit more white to it when I get to the, the higher spots. So um, in a nutshell, basically what I try to do at this point is to just get some value and get some paint on there because I know that I'm going to refine it much more later when I come back to it with, uh, with the artist paints. Now I'm switching to an artist brush that's actually um, about an inch, and it's a it's a Blick flat, and uh, I'm not sure what the number is. I think it's a twenty. Thank you, Brooke. nice thing about working in, uh, in various layers is that um, if I make a mistake in the drawing or sort of basically color outside of the lines, I know that I'm going to repaint all of this over completely later. So it's really okay if it's rough or if it's messy, I know that I'm going to be able to fix it up later with subsequent passes. And uh, one of the reasons why I'm using um, enamel Alkid house paint is it's really sturdy. It dries super fast. And so it'll allow me to, um, to do some blending, but it'll also be dry enough to, to play with in a day, you know, or less than a day sometimes.
So I just wanted to come over and say hello to some people like Jeff and Marv and Michael and William. You know. See the crayon that's underneath there sort of picking up a little bit.
I'm going to do some simple color things, which are really not introduce any color into that t-shirt except for a little bit of warm and a little bit of cool gray. So on the top part, the front part of the shirt that's hitting the most light, I'm going to just really just slam that with some almost bright white with a little bit of other impurities added in. Knowing that I'm actually going to paint over this with, uh, with more paint later, um, thicker artist paint. This paint is uh, already starting to dry, which makes it, you know, sort of ideal for, for the working method that I'm working with because then when it's completely dry, I can start over on it tomorrow or the, you know, when I get back to it. So I'm going to just wave at people like Owen and Rude and Jorge, Pam, Antonio. Thanks for joining me. Good morning. Um, from Australia. Wow. Oh, hi, Antonio.
It almost looks like a pastel drawing. It's kind of funny. I wonder if it's uh, like I'm not completely happy with this underpainting, but I think it's because maybe I decided to do it on camera. <laughs> and sometimes it makes it harder when you're demoing stuff to do things the way you do when you're a little less conscious of yourself. But um, I know that I'll be able to come back to this and rework it later. So I guess that's okay. Also rushed a little bit with it.
Well, I think that's a pretty good start for an underpainting. And um, let's see if I can zoom in on it a little bit. Oh, I guess I need to turn that up a little bit. Um, good morning. Uh, so that's where I'm going to end for today. And uh, thanks for hanging out with me while I did this. I hope that um, it helped some of you to think about how you want to try to learn how to paint and that kind of thing. Also, just transparency in my working methods, I guess. So have a great day. Bye.